first an honor to be joined now by the co-author of our former colleague Stuart Scott's recently published posthumous memoir, Every Day I Fight, Larry Platt. Welcome. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Heath. Good so to be here. Clear something up at the beginning here. This was not intended to be a posthumous memoir by any sense. No, not, not at all. Yeah. Uh, I first met Stuart uh, uh, about a year ago mm -hmm. and uh, spent the day with him and realized that this was going to be a different kind of project. Uh, he wanted it to be real. He wanted it to be raw. He wanted to keep it real. Uh, and and we intended to to he he should be sitting here right yeah. now. I, no offense to you, but I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. I would much rather be interviewing him under any circumstances Absolutely. right now. Uh, people who, who who know about the last, it's really ten years, given first the eye problems and then the cancer, and particularly the last year, were always amazed that he continued to work. But did you get the impression, as I did and, and and have from other colleagues I've worked with who've been in similar situations, that to some degree the work also helped in the fight? Because there, there's particularly about this, you have to do it. You have to be alert. You have to be on, if you will. And I always thought that that probably was as much of a help to him as he was courageous to keep doing it. Oh, absolutely. Um, he says in the book that that he didn't want to just be a cancer patient mm -hmm. and sit at home, and because if he couldn't work, he didn't feel alive. Um, and you know. He didn't just fight cancer. The, the, the book is a chronicle of a life well fought. Mm -hmm. he, he, he fought on every possible level up until the very end. I know. Uh, I was going to ask you about that because there's one thing that uh, when, when he passed away, the piece that I did here was it's less true. about that. Thank you. But it was less about this struggle, which was um, obvious to all who saw him. I mean, I, as I said, the last time I worked with him, I, I didn't know how he was going to get up on the stage with me. And I was thinking, well, what contingency plans? And he was flawless. Right. He, he staggered up the stairs and then he's in view and suddenly he's on. But do, do, you, do you worry, did he worry that he was being pigeonholed as a, as the cancer sportscaster? I mean, I hate to be grotesque Absolutely. about it, but did yeah. he worry about that? Because there was so much else in his life and particularly combative things and important things for, for the industry, for this company, for his, you know, his, his own people, his own, his own culture. Well, you know, uh, very much so. He, he, he struggled with this, what he called the, the cape, people wanting him to wear this right. Superman cape and be this warrior. He didn't often, he didn't always feel like a warrior. He felt there were hundreds of times he wanted to quit. There were hundreds of, of times where he cried. Mm -hmm. uh, the book is full of that. Um, but as he says, those moments were not his last moments and they weren't his enduring moments. Um, you know, when you, when you talk about his resiliency, the ESPY speech, right. uh, he, he had just had four surgeries in the span of seven days. Um, his doctors didn't want him to, to fly out to L.A., mm -hmm. uh, but he felt called to do it. He felt it was for a bigger purpose, and the purpose was he was speaking to cancer patients, and he wanted to give cancer patients permission to, to lie down once in a while and not feel right. like you have to be a superhero. Uh, throughout his career, uh, people told him at first it wasn't just cancer, and I know he addressed the cancer personally as if it were a thing that you could talk to, as other right. people have named their cancers. It's a, it's a brilliant idea when you think about it. But he fought a lot of different things, including uh, what has driven most of the people who become successes in this industry. Somebody who said, you're, never, you're, you're terrible at this, you ought to find another line. So go sell hot dogs, right? Yeah, graduated from UNC, sent out 27 resumes, one of the best, biggest offers in, mm -hmm. in broadcasting history, 0 for 27. And the last one was a news director uh, who said, uh, I got to tell you, you suck. You'll never amount to anything. Uh, and Stuart uh, was devastated. He yeah. remembers, he talks in, in the book about uh, crying, sobbing in his dorm room um, for 20 minutes. And then he committed that guy's name to memory oh, yes. and he was going to show him. And it was only until the last 10 years that he threw that name out and, and doesn't even remember, didn't even remember it uh, once, he, once he no I, longer had anything to prove. I remember mine. <laughs> he, he, he spent 30 years over Rochester, New York in traffic plane, and I thought I won in any event. Um, <laughs> so inspirationally, uh, in, in terms of what the book means, it, it, rather than try to sell it to somebody as, well, this is going to, tell me your own story about this, because uh, as, I, as I've said many times about my, when my dad was in the hospital, he was sick for five months, and he overcame the cancer, and everything else got him. Mm. Uh, he, he, it was not just inspiration in the fight against cancer, or victorious or not victorious. He showed me how to do this when it is my turn to do this. Yeah. Oh, boy. I, and, and, and that is, I, I hope, what readers take from this book. Because for me, when, you're, when you are that 
intimately involved with someone going through what Stuart went through, um, you inevitably look inward and mm -hmm. say to yourself, could I possess such grace and character um, and courage, even though Stuart didn't like being called courageous. Right. Um, and I, frankly, I don't think I score out very well in that, in that exercise comparatively. But my hope is that readers will, will similarly look, look at themselves in this. Uh, and that's, that's what's inspirational right. about Stuart's story. Yeah, so. you're, you're not looking at some superhero who, who, who was never in doubt. And, you know, I mean, like, as I mentioned, I'll, I use the comparison to my dad again just briefly. My dad didn't like to go to the dentist and had, like, an exposed bridge por portion of a bridge for three years because he was terrified of going to the dentist. In the hospital, he was the bravest man I ever saw. So it, you don't have to, maybe what, what Stuart's message in this is, you don't have to be brave all the time or even at that's all right. until it really counts. That, that's exactly Save right. Save it for then. It's okay then. That's, that's, that's right. And, and sometimes bravery is another way of saying you have no choice. He, <laughs> right. he, he says in the book, yeah. I, I'm not brave. I just don't want to die. Yeah. And, and so wh what are you going to do? You, you, you fight. And, you know, he was, he, that's why he committed to go sh straight from chemo every time to the gym and do mixed martial arts. When I, I, I can't do his routine Anyway, but after chemo, I no. mean, it's crazy. I know. I've had colleagues who've gone on the air right after chemo just because they wanted the normality. They wanted some normalcy. Did he get that? Because, as you said, it was such. It was. It was so identified as a cancer fighter. Did he get the normality? He did. He did. And I think um, there was an element of wisdom that that came. Uh, he, he was, a, as you well know, a Type A personality. Yes. He, he learned patience. Yeah. Uh, as a result of cancer. I mean, that's the, the paradox, right? Yeah. He says in the book that, like, the paradox is that cancer just might make you the man you always wanted to be. Yeah, unbelievable. All right, it's called Every Day I Fight by Stuart Scott and Larry Platt. And, uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry you're, only, you're the only one here to talk about it, but I'm glad you're able to do that. All the best with it. Thank you.